Hello and welcome to Oak Road Hatter Podcast. I'm joined by Adam Driscoll and Jamie Castle, as always, and to discuss and dissect Portsmouth versus Luton, we're joined by Jake Smith. Welcome, Jake. Um, if you don't know Jake, he's the host of Pompey Live and the Football Hour on Portsmouth Express FM. It's great to have you here. Yeah, it's great to um, great to be here to talk about what was um, one of the most entertaining nil nil draws that I've I've seen watching Pompey. There's been plenty of them, but it was certainly up there one of the most entertaining ones for sure. And we'll get straight into that. So before we do anything, though, be sure to follow us on all the social media platforms at, at Oak Road Hatter and like, comment and subscribe on YouTube. And we would love if you could rate us five stars on any audio platform you listen to us. We really appreciate the support and it helps us to provide the best content for you. But we'll get straight into it and we'll look at that that nil-nil draw that obviously Jake's just described as one of the most entertaining nil-nil draws he's ever seen. And I think there is probably only one place to start. And it is Thomas Kaminsky's, I don't even know what to describe it as, um, a brain failure, I don't know, a, a moment <laughs> of madness, we'll call it. So, Jamie, we'll go straight to you. Obviously, you were in that away end and witnessed it firsthand. So, we'll start with the first yellow, obviously, which has been ra- raised a bit, a bit of contention with by Edwards and among some fans. But what your what were your thoughts on it for the time wasting? Yeah, I mean, for me, it quite simply isn't time wasting. I mean, I, I can see why the ref thinks it could be in terms of, I mean, he, he did take too long on, on the ball. Like, there's, there's no arguments against that. But um, I think with the greatest of respect to the situation, as as the, the, the team that is favourites in the game, just by, by simple virtue of the fact that we are ex-Premier League and Pompey are, are sort of former League One up, up to the Championship. Like, I think it's a stretch to think that after 30 minutes we're going to go to Fratton Park and time waste. I think just, just as that, as a concept, just is, is a bit, I think to, to me, a bit alien. And um, you, you see a lot of clubs now, especially clubs where they are favourites in a situation, try and play out from the back and and do take a bit of extra time on the ball. Um, it wasn't the first time we'd done it. I think a, a couple of minutes earlier, they had taken a, a, a bit longer and I think Mengi took the goal kick in the end. Um and you can you can see between Kaminsky and Mengi there, but there was a bit of a of a mother's meeting, let's say, where Kaminsky was trying to usher Mengi up the pitch. Quite clearly, Kaminsky didn't see it was on in terms of the the, the short pass, but Mengi was being fairly stubborn and and just stood there, or, or hands hands on his hip almost, a bit like, "No, I'm I'm standing here because we've been told that we're going to play out from the back." Um, and then, yeah, just amongst the, the whole mess of eventually Kaminsky rolling the ball to Mengi to, to, to take the, the, the goal kick, you see the ref run a little bit towards him and show the, show the yellow card. At first, I had no idea who, who he'd given it to because he sort of like waved it about a bit and I was just like, OK, who, who's, who's actually given that to him? And in the end, he sort of pointed it at the keeper. Um, so for me, I mean, I, I'll be keen to hear Jake's view on his thoughts on the first yellow card like in, in terms of the home end, but... Yeah, I think it was a bit of a stupid yellow card to give us, especially that that early on. Yeah, I think you're right. It's um, it's a strange concept to think that Luton came down to Fratton Park to time waste, especially off the back of a a four one defeat to Burnley. You are right in saying that. Yeah, um, John Busby, the the official, had spoken to Kaminsky once before that um, in relation to not necessarily time wasting, maybe slowing the game down, but also like you say going to that game plan of playing it short and, and that's the style of play that Rob Edwards Ed, Ed, Ed wants to commit to. So, yeah, it, it was a bizarre yellow card, I must admit. It's clearly one of those cases of the referees having one of those days where he's not taking anything, you know, not... not He's being strict, basically, and I think it's very unfortunate that Kaminsky was given that first yellow, um, especially considering the circumstances of the fact that when the referee had enough it was actually Mengi, Mengi in possession of the ball so that was a bit confusing um, in respect to obviously what then happened afterwards a few moments later um, whether you're on a yellow card or not as a goalkeeper why are you coming out of your box like that but especially on a yellow mm-hmm. card as well there's as Finley mentioned at the top of the show like it's just it's just complete lapse of concentration a brain fart it's you, you don't do that at all let alone on a yellow card so it's not even just the, the fact he took out Paddy Lane he then went in for seconds with Connor Ogilvy 
I think that in itself was probably warrants two yellow cards. Um, so yeah, no complaints, obviously, <laughs> at, at the red card decision. But I can certainly understand why Luton fans would be a little bit peeved off at the fact that you know the first yellow card was shown for the um, supposed time wasting. And we will go straight onto those. Well, onto that second yellow card, which could have been yeah two separate yellow cards in itself for both of the of the challenges. Firstly, Adam, what was he doing that far out of the box when they had covering defenders? There was just no reason for him to be there. What were your thoughts on where he was at the time? Yeah, when I saw the highlights, uh, I was actually listening to it on the radio in the car and Simon Oxley was doing a very good job of describing uh, what was going on, as he normally does. Um, I, but, you know, seeing it back, it's just absolute madness. I think the ball, you know, I think the, the Portsmouth forward is, is going to get to the ball before Bell. But his touch is going to take him out left. It's the, the touch he's going to take, the way he's shaping up, he's not going to be going towards goal. Um, so Kaminsky's just had an absolute shocker. He should have left it to Bell. Uh, we had enough defenders around the situation as well, I think. You know, even if Bell takes him wide and we deal with that, you know, on, on the left-hand side. Um, I do think maybe there's an element of, is he having flashbacks to Burnley? Should he have come out for their second? Because I, I think he should. And I said it on the night last week. Um, but yeah, wrong decision, unfortunately, and compounded, uh, you know, what went on before, as you guys have described already. And we'll, we'll talk more about that, that second challenge, because the first challenge wasn't, wasn't a good challenge and it was reckless. The second challenge was a real horror tackle. And I think from some perspectives, I think that could have been a straight red card. What were your thoughts on the challenge on Ogilvy, Jake? Yeah, hundred percent agree. Um, whether he was on a yellow or not, I think the the challenge, the second one on Ogilvy was in itself probably warranted of, a, of, of perhaps a red. It, obviously, the challenge doesn't come if it's not for the build up and the, the first tackle on Paddy Lane, which in itself was obviously not an ideal situation to find yourself in as a goalkeeper. But yeah, the second one I think on Ogilvy was pure. I think it's head loss. I think it's desperation. He's acknowledged the fact that he's lost out on the challenge to Paddy Lane. Um, Conor Ogilvy's then has got you know, 30, 35 yards. The goal's not open, but it's it's a good opportunity for him to just lift it over the goalkeeper and get and get one in. So I think it's that pure desperation that he's lunged him there. I don't think he can have he can have too many complaints. Um, what did confuse me was when he then made his way to the dugout area when he was being sent off and he went to the tunnel. Um, I think he refused to go off. I think he was waiting for the substitute goalkeeper James Shade to come on, but I, I don't think the officials would have let the game continue if James Shade hadn't come on. So I don't know what I don't know why he was reluctant to go off, thinking that they'd just let the game resume because they wouldn't have done that. But yeah, I think the, the second challenge on Ogilvy could have been a red card. He could have made a case for it, but obviously, given the um, Supposed time wasting and the other challenge on lane, then yeah, no complaints with that. And you know, even if that was Will Norris doing it, the other end, I wouldn't be sat here saying, "Oh no, he's you know, it's too strict and he shouldn't have been sent off." It, it's one hundred percent a red card. Um, I do sympathise with the first yellow. Just going back to that one because Will Norris done it all season last year. We won League One through not entirely that, but it was a lot of factors included. But every single goal kick was. Will Norris will pick it up. He'll take his time. As long as he can, he will push the limits. I don't think he got a single yellow card last season either for it. And every single time, as soon as the referee comes over to say something, he'll throw it to Sean Raggett and he'll take a short goal kick. It happened every single match. And we were very fortunate that we we did get away with it for so long. So as soon as Kaminsky and Mengi were sort of doing that, we could acknowledge the style of play that you were trying to set out. And yeah, it's very unfortunate. But, you know, on the day we had a strict referee. Yeah, and I think Jake's nailed on on head there a little bit because I mean I don't want to turn this into a bit of a referee bash. I think on the whole we did did okay, but all we want as fans is consistency, right? I mean the, the amount of times goalkeepers come to Kenworth Road and it takes them until probably 89, 90 minutes to even have, have a talk into let let learn a yellow card, and then for Kaminsky to to do it arguably supposedly once and to, and then twice and then get a yellow card after twenty nine minutes, it, yeah, it it is. A slight sour taste because of just the amount of times we've seen it as as Luton fans at the Kenny. You just think, ugh, like you got like nine nine thousand hatters at at, uh, at Kenworth Road screaming for like an hour of the game, with like referee, like hurry hurry them up, and then 
nothing happens. So he, he just he almost just looks down at, at, at his boots and just sort of head in shame and just waits for him to kick it in and plays on. Um, so yeah, I think that 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 for me is my pro probably my main frustration. But no, I I don't disagree at all with the second challenge. It's it's stupid for me. Maybe has a, an element of that argument with Mengi two minutes earlier on, on his mind, probably a bit pissed off that Mengi didn't did, didn't do what, what what he'd asked him to and, and get up the pitch just for on that one occasion. So he's probably still thinking about that in his head. Um, but he's he's experienced enough to know. I mean, if we had if we had a keeper that was 22, 23, you'd you'd probably excuse it a little bit. But he's what 30, 30 31. He, he should know better by now. Yeah, I mean, I think you know if we're going to have referees that are doing that as well, we need to wise up because we're clearly trying to play out the back a little bit more this season. And so if it's clearly obvious the referees, you know, waiting to get his card out, then we need to make sure we get the ball live. I, I know Edwards was saying we want to draw the forwards out. But if it means Kaminsky tapping it to Mengi and then we're live and then we draw them out, then then great. Um, so we, we probably need to, as much as we want the referees to be consistent, we do need to be a bit cleverer because, you know, we can't be getting keeper or centre-half booked um, every game and then expecting, a, expecting, you know, not to get a red card at some point as well. I actually kind of think that the, the first yellow card for Kaminsky will actually be of a bit of a, a blessing in disguise for you guys. And hear me out because I think the second challenge on Ogilvy itself, maybe if Kaminsky hadn't got the first yellow, the referee's thinking straight red. I, I, I entirely believe he's probably thinking that. Mm. Given the fact it's two yellow cards and a red, he only misses one game. Straight red and it's three games. So actually, I think the time wasting, I think you can probably thank John Busby that he's done that because now he's only out for one game instead of three. So yeah, I, I don't know if. Um, if, if that can be seen as a slight silver lining, but I certainly think the second challenge on Ogilvy itself is a straight red. So, yeah, perhaps a bit fortuitous, but he was supposedly deemed as time-wasting and got that first yellow. Yeah, so as Jake mentioned, there, we'll, Kaminsky will only miss one game, and that'll be the, the visit to Preston, who are in a bit of chaos at the moment anyway, but we'll come back to that on another day. But we'll have James Shea in between the sticks for that game. Just before we move on, uh, Jake, can I just ask you what the reaction was in sort of the Portsmouth end to, well, firstly, the obviously the first yellow card is a bit contentious anyway, but the sending off itself. <laughs> yeah, um, the first yellow card, it's pretty, eh, fairly muted. There were a few jeers, but I think, like I said earlier, based on the fact that we kind of played that style last season, I don't think many were in, entirely you know, shouting for the first yellow card to be drawn that early. Um, the second one, I think, yeah, it's 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 kind of jubilation. I, I, I wouldn't lie in saying that a few around us were sort of cele celebrating it almost like a goal, you know, to go three quarters of the rest of the game to against a, a relegated Premier League side. And we knew our backs were going to be against the wall anyway with the kind of quality that Luton had got within their team, knowing that we'd head into the rest of that game with the man advantage. It kind of felt like a goal. It, it felt like a, a, a big turning point in the game and something that, you know, we had to capitalise on. And unfortunately, we didn't. But yeah, it, it felt like one of those big moments where, you know, Fratton Park is going to be a, a big factor for us this season. We're going to need um, to try and make it a fortress if we're going to have any chance of, you know, trying to stay up the season, maybe pushing on a bit further. And the fans we know can be the 12th man. It's, it's a big cliche, but, you know, last season, that Fratton Park atmosphere, it won us a lot of points in the dying embers of games. A lot of last minute equalisers, a lot of last minute winners. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that red card, it, it, it boosted the confidence. It boosted a bit of momentum around the place. And I do think it helped us get the draw in the end because I still think that a 10-man Luton against an 11-man Portsmouth with the Premier League quality against the League One kind of championship quality still evens itself out as a, a pretty a pretty fair game. So, yeah, it's it was celebrated almost like a goal. But, um, you know, we knew that we were up against it even with 10 men. So, come the end of the game, I think we were just very happy with the point. And that is where we're going next. So I just wanted to ask a bit more about the result itself and the remainder of the game. Did do you all feel, or Jamie and Jake, did you feel that it was... A fair result for both sides, the nil nil draw. Yeah, I think the result on the whole is 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 fair. Um, I I don't think either side created an awful lot, if I'm honest, for, in that in that last sixty minutes. I think both sides had a few decent chances, but nothing where I'm thinking, oh, that's an absolute like clear cut opportunity, and it, it should be a goal. Um, I think for me, obviously, as as 
as Jake said, I think the the ten ma- the sort of that that, that ten man Luton was, was massive for Pompey. I think the first half hour we were pretty dominant, and I think again Portsmouth themselves looked fairly lively going forwards when when they got the opportunity to. But I mean, we we had two clear clear opportunities in that first half hour. I think Morris for one that he tried to slip under under the keeper's legs, but but he did want to get down. Um, so personally, in the first half hour, he probably should have been one, maybe two up. Um, but yeah, in in that in that sort of last last sixty, I think it was a fairly even game. Neither side really could say that they des- deserved to go on and, and and grab a goal. Um, so on the whole, I think nil nil was probably fair. Yeah, I definitely think the point of piece was the uh, <laughs> the fair outcome from that, as um, as Jamie's touched upon. Um, but the, the opening stages of the game, we were um, sort of up against it, knowing that. Um, Luton had the, the better of the chances. Carlton Morris obviously being subbed off as a result of a red card was a big sort of big turning point as well. But you know, towards the latter stages of the game, we had the opportunities on Saturday and as well as the Carabao Cup fixture last Tuesday night as well. Um, we have lacked a bit of a cutting edge in front of goal. We've got Colby Bishop out. We've got Cassidy Yengi out as well. So we are suffering with a few injuries. Not to make excuses, but you know, heading into that second half, we. We had the opportunity maybe to, to nick the opener, but also quite wary, as I said a minute ago, even a 10-man Premier League quality side that Luton have got um, is it, still a, a tough ask to try and get through. And we didn't want to commit, or it seemed like we didn't want to commit too many bodies forward in the final five, 10 minutes where perhaps we could have floated a ball in a bit earlier. We could have gone forward a bit sooner than we did. Um, but I think the team and you know the, the, most of Fratton Park knowing that how quick Luton were on the counter attack, particularly with Ogbené, Jordan Clark as well. Such a threat, and any slight lapse in concentration, whether you're against ten men or eleven men, Luton, um, you know, we could have thrown away that point. So, yeah, we had the opportunity to maybe take it and win it. Perhaps we could have been a bit braver had it been last season we we're chasing promotion, but this season where every single point is vital and we're trying to stay up, then that's a, a pretty decent point. I think we'll run with it. Adam, I'll just come to you there. Um, and obviously, we came out of the off the back of the Burnley game, really quite critical and pretty uncertain about what to expect next. So do you think um, a point away at Fratton Park is a good result for Luton? Yeah, I mean, I said last week in the predictions, I thought a point would be good, just given where we were with defence and attack and midfield. I have to say, when I saw the team news and I saw Bellin um, and Clark back in, I was a little bit more positive as to what we might what we might get. Um but obviously, then when you see the game pan out, the first you know, the first half pan out as it did, I, I I'd be lying if I didn't go back to the whole situation of a point would be a good point. So yeah, for me, it's a point on the board, really good clean sheet as well, um, something that I do our confidence the world of good, um, and yeah, I think one to one to tick off, fairly happy with, and, and move on to Saturday. And Jake, I'm just gonna come back to you quickly. Um, we just I just wanted to ask a bit more about. Obviously, Portsmouth's aims, sort of hopes for the rest of the season as a newly promoted side. Um, what do you think Portsmouth fans should expect from your side? And do you think they need to bring in any more additions? You mentioned that you're a bit light up front because of some injuries. Yeah, um, I think, you know, the expectation just from my own personal standpoint would be purely survival. You know, we want to try and maintain our status in this division, try and sustain ourselves as well. Something the the ownership behind the scenes have tried to or have been doing for the last seven years. It's not necessarily the reason why it took us so long to get out of League One, but, you know, they, they didn't throw the money at it. You know, we've done it in a... In a, in a sensible, I guess, in a sustainable way. And in doing so, I guess it's it's laid the foundations for what we now find ourselves being in the championship. And um, the expectation is to stay up. There'll be some out there who will want to exceed them expectations and they'll go, oh, no, you know, we should aim for the top half and go for the playoffs. But, you know, Ipswich Town doing what they did last season maybe has not helped us with that with that expectation because I think some will look at that and go, oh, why can't we do that? But if we finish in 21st on the last game of the season and survive on goal difference, that means all the same that it would finish in seventh. You know, it, it counts for all the same. So personally, I think we can finish higher than 21st. I, I believe there are at least three teams in the division that are either stagnating. They've been on the downward trajectory for quite a while now. They've got worse squads than us. Oxford have surprised me, but how long will that last? I don't know. But all in all, I think we've got the quality about us to finish higher than 
you know, the relegation zone. We do need additions. We are looking light in midfield and in attack. We're losing a lot of injuries. We had this last season as well. Somehow we got through it. Um, the mentality behind the scenes and the kind of character that John Massinho is instilling into the squad, it, it cannot be underestimated because we had Regan Paul out of most of last season. We lost Alex Robertson halfway through the campaign. He was one of the most exciting players in the division. We still managed to win the league. Um, so, you know, go to, go to Leeds and get a three or draw. Hold Luton to a nil-nil draw, despite the ten-man, um, you know, side of things. There's some sort of confidence among the squad, but it's just grinding out results, and I think we'll continue to do that as the season goes on. But we definitely need at least three or four more additions. Thank you very much, Jake. I'm sure that Luton fans can sort of share some of the things you said there. Probably mainly the injuries, which we know just as well as you, is a valid excuse. I think. Um, we're going to go to a break now, but just before we go, where where can we find you, Jake, on social media and elsewhere? Yeah, so at X uh, and on Instagram as well, uh, at Jake Pompey Smith. Um, yeah, just that's it, really. <laughs> yeah, at Jake Pompey Smith on both um, X and Instagram. Thank you very much. So that's at, at Jake Pompey Smith on X and Instagram. As I said, we're going to a break now. When we come back, we'll be discussing a bit more on the transfer window and some shape and formations for Luton. Welcome back to Oak Road Hatter, where I'm still joined by Adam Driscoll and Jamie Castle. As I mentioned before, we're going to be going on to a bit about Luton shape, um, which obviously had to change just purely because we had a man sent off against Portsmouth, Jamie. Well, what did you think of the sort of the change of structure at the back? Yeah, I mean, I I, I liked it. I mean, yeah, so when the keeper got sent off, we went to like a four four one. We put Walters at right back and Doughty at left back with with Mengi and Bell as as the as the, sort of the 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 two together. Um, and then we had Chong left, Chio right, and then um, Baptiste and Clark in, in in the middle, but behind Eli. And I think structurally that worked a lot better. Um, I I really really like Waters, and I think going back to the game, I think Silvera was probably Pompey's main bright spark. I think he was. I mean, I I joked to um, a mate that for me he's like a typical five side player where he's got like the sort of low socks, the, the the nice bright boots, and threatens to do a few skills, but has not not much end product, which I think was was right with Silvera. But regardless, I think Walters sort of one v one sort of he he wasn't really threatened, and Chio did really well to sort of drop back and and, and help him as well with the uh, left back Ogilvy. So I think from a shape perspective, when you've got two wide players and I think give credit to Chong as well right where as a player that is known for his sort of technique and his flair and going forwards those sort of players don't often have the work rate to match and I think Chong definitely does does that I think he he tracked back really well on that left for for, for, for Doughty as well um so as a shape I mean obviously it was, it was only 4-4-1 but for me if if we looked at it as maybe with a 4-2-3-1 or like a 4-4-2 maybe out of possession um I think it's something that I actually really like, and I was I was sort of digesting it a little bit after the game, and just sort of seeing this. Like if it was a four two three one, how could we match up? And I think I mean Walters first of all goes to his natural position, which is right back in a four. I think he has definitely has potential as sort of right and a half and a three, but I think fundamentally for now he is a, he is a right back in a four. So he goes into his natural position. You've got Doughty at left back. Then you've got Mengi plus one in that in, in sort of in that defence. It seems like that plus one probably will be McGuinness and we'll come on to him shortly. Um then you've got Baptiste plus one in, in centre mid, and hopefully that plus one is someone that we sign um in sort of due course, but it could be Nikamba when he's back. Clark could could sort of fill in there for, for when it's a, a game where we'd consider favourites or, or maybe like an easier home game. Um, and then you've got Chong and Chio as, as as your wide players, and for me, I would really like to see actually Morris in that number ten, almost like a Harry Kane type role, right? Where I think he's he he sort of can really link up that play, um, and then it allows us to go to that four four two out of possession. And um, do I think that's something that Rob might go for uh, immediately? No, but I think if um, 
if I guess our start, okay, I think Pompey in in hindsight, I think I, I, I was very subdued at the time, but I think in hindsight, it, it's a good point and we, we played well on the whole. But if results start to sort of or, or continue as they are and we sort of start to struggle a little bit, then I, I certainly could see him changing it from this sort of three three four three to a to, to a four two three one type um, formation. But I think in in the in the immediate future, I think he's going to stick to this back three. Uh, whether that's right or wrong, I guess we'll 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 see what happens. But yeah, I, I think that there definitely is is room to move to a four two three one if if need be. And you mentioned Walters there. Obviously, he's been probably our most impressive player from the opening two games. Obviously, that Burnley game was a difficult one to judge, but he came out of that looking still quite positive despite the results. So Adam, what are your thoughts on him as a as an addition and as a player in that Luton side? And what do you think is sort of best position would be for us. Yeah, he looks he looks really good. He um for his age, he he really, you know, meets the challenge physically. Um whereas I would probably say at the moment at the moment someone like Joe Johnson maybe doesn't. And that's that's not on not a dig at him. It's just, you know, the way the way he's built. So what Walters definitely matches the physicality. Um I think you know, just talking about the shape there, I I I like the way we set up. Um if we have enough centre half options, you know, three centre halves, let, letting the wing backs progress and get high up the pitch. We've seen how good Doughty is high up the pitch as well. And I think, you know, the first half against Pompey, Ogbené was sort of ploughing down the right hand side until he until he couldn't, let's say. So I I personally like the way the way we shape up with that kind of three four three, if you like, uh, or or you know, whatever we want to call it. Um, and I think, as Jamie said. I don't see Edwards changing. Um, I think he will stick with that, but we certainly do need, you know, to be a bit more flexible at times. There's there's lots of times in the game, not necessarily because of a scenario, but in game where we can think, actually, we do have the personnel now to change that up. And I, w- I would like to see us change it a little bit more if we're not, you know, if we're not as fluid or as effective as we want to be um, with that original or initial form- starting formation. I've said previously like what I thought about Walters, but I think it it comes a bit of a dilemma on the assumption that McGuinness comes in. We're we're very right side heavy at the minute at, at, in terms of centre halves, and look, Mengi's first name on the team sheet. Assuming he stays, so let's assume he stays. Um, do, I mean McGuinness, you we bring in and the the quoted fee that that we're paying for him. It, it's almost as if he's a guaranteed starter because there's no way you pay that sort of money if he, if he's not right. So, w- where does Walters fit in in that situation? Do, do you move Mengi over to the left and drop Bell and then put McGuinness in the middle and Walters on the right, or do you keep Bell, move Mengi to the right, put McGuinness in the middle, and then put Walters at right wing back? Um, and I think there's probably no, no one answer to that. And obviously, I'll well, be good to get to get you, 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 your guys' thoughts. But maybe in the tougher game, you do do Walters as, as right wing back. Maybe in the easier ones, you do Chio at right wing back. But I think Walters is someone that I really want to try and give forty plus games to. Who's obviously subject to in, to, uh, to um, injury, but I think it's certainly easier to to build into a season having one position nailed down. So I think it. It's something that we really need to work out as as a club in terms of where he fits in this side. Now, before the signing of, of McGuinness, for me it was hands down whites and a half. Um, because I think that's just the, that's where he, he suits best. And we, we know Rob likes his athletic, not flying wide centre halves, but sort of athletic and can play high and then can can, can sort of drop back if need be and just and and, and have those fast tracking runs. Um but with with McGuinness signing, I'm not too sure. I think I just can't see him nailing down 35, 40 games at 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 White's and a half. But I'm I'm not not sure what you do think. I mean, it's a good dilemma to have. You know, we're certainly a week on from last week, and all of a sudden we look like we've got defensive options with Bell coming back, potentially McGuinness coming in. It looks like that's nearly done. Um, and then Burke and Anderson not far away. So. It's nice to have those options. I, I I hear what you say about Walters. I'd be very very surprised if he gets forty games or more. I think they will. They'll bed him in as they have done, but they'll also pull him out as 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 quickly as they need to. So for me, I would say you know, if the window shut tomorrow and McGuinness came in, 
I would be looking at uh, Mengi on that right side of the three, McGuinness in the middle, and probably Amari Bell on the left. Um, but again, you know, with the options of of bringing in the likes of Anderson, maybe for McGuinness and uh, Burke, uh, Burke as well, and and you know, we've got a lot of options there now. So it's um, all of a sudden we look we look like like we've got a pretty decent defensive structure, really. Yeah, we obviously we've been well last season we were crying out for a defender because we had so many injured and then start of this season we've had more injury struggles obviously we started that first game with Johnson and Walters at both at either side of either side of Mengi but with McGuinness looking like it's almost a done deal obviously things can go wrong between now now I'm going to come confirmation and we don't want to jinx it um it does give us that flexibility but do you think Obviously, you mentioned there, Jamie, putting Doughty at left back in a back four. Would that restrict him at all going forward? No, I, I don't. I don't think so. I think, I mean, there's this concept of sort of in and out of possession, right? Where you've got uh, out of possession, Doughty drops into a to a four, um, and yeah, I, I think that, that 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 could work really well. And then then for sort of when you're on the ball, you say Doughty just push up because our right back's not going anywhere, right? Or, or, our right wingers, Chio. Chio is sort of doing that work that you're doing on the left. So our right back's going nowhere and, and they can sit in a three. So it gives Doughty that license to, to know that he can just run forward without really having to care too much about about sort of who's behind him because you know that you've got a strong left centre half likely in McGuinness if, if, if that was the case. That, that can sort of defend anything 1v1 or even a defender like him probably can defend 1v2, right? And just sort of, he, he can just defend the space rather than the man on the ball. Um, so no, I don't I don't think it would stifle Doughty. I think, um, I think ironically as well, if we went to a four, certainly away from home, if we go to Ellen Road and we play and we were playing a four, I actually probably would play Doughty at left wing as well. I think I think you you'd play a back four almost sort of like Pep esque, right? Where you've got Bell at left back, Walters at right back, Mengi and McGuinness as a centre half. So you've got a flat back four, a solid back four, and then you've got Doughty left wing, and he's he's just his his job is really just to pin that that that, that right back back all game. Um, so I think Doughty has that flexibility as well. I think because he he was a winger by trade to start with, so there's no reason why he can't play as a winger going forwards. And I think that's probably an area actually where we're pretty weak at the minute because we could lose Woodrow and or Taylor. And suddenly if you lose lose one or both of those, then you probably could do with, with an extra forward. And if you look at our attacking options, they're very centre heavy. Um, okay, you've got Chong, but he can also play sort of central in, in a 10. We've not really got too many wide players um, because Towns ends off. Chio were playing at win back, but obviously you can play there. Um, other than that, we've not really got a lot. Adam, I'll just come to you there. Obviously, we've mentioned there that we there isn't long left in the window and we still haven't done much business. McGuinness is obviously looking like it's nearly over the line. Is there someone else that you... Obviously, Liam Walsh has been linked. Is that somewhere you still think we need to, to push for more in a bit midfield? Yeah, I do think so. Um a couple of weeks ago or a week or so ago, I said two centre-halves, centre-mid. I don't think we need two centre-halves anymore. I think I, I'm quite relaxed on that with Bell back. And it, I was surprised how quickly he was back on the bench. So happy with the one centre-half. Um, centre-mid, we definitely need another body. And I think probably someone of that defensive mind. So, you know, Clark coming back in at the weekend. Well, I mean, he kind of set up our two best chances to Morris and Adebayo. He... He, I think we we kind of forget how good he is, and still is, particularly at this level. Um, so with with um, you know Clark, Baptiste, Helly, and the Camber returning, and obviously young Zach Nelson, if we th- if we add another body in there, I think that's pretty solid. Um, Nelson for me is good enough to be on the bench at the very least. Whereas you could say now Joe Johnson could have a loan. I think there's potential for him to go out on loan. I keep Nelson about. But definitely a um, a defensive minded midfielder, and you know we were linked last week with this Brighton lad who they signed uh, two months ago for five mil. Uh, I don't know a lot about him, but I think he's that sort of like young in the camber mould. So th- to me, that would be you know really perfect in completing our midfield. On on JJ, I think for now he definitely st- I think he definitely sticks around. Um, you've got Doughty as left wing back and Bowers left centre half, and then. 
for carbon revival those you don't really have an awful lot you, you can definitely play a center half out out of out of position so to speak in terms of on or, or on their wrong side um but yeah there's there's no there's no cover at all in terms of that, that left wing back so I, for me i'd i'd like to to keep jj cert, certainly for for, the, for this window i mean let's see what happens in january right and you, you could get six months in january but um with um news looming and i'm sure we'll get onto that as well in terms of alfie potentially being subject to to interest um i wouldn't i wouldn't be sending him anywhere just yet um and then in terms of sentiment i completely agree i think for me i actually want someone that's got a bit more creativity i think i really like jordan clark and and what he brings and i think technically he's still for me one of our better players i think the quality has he has on the ball um the way that he can just beat a man and uh, and sort of get past that midfielder is sometimes really something to watch going around where we got him from Akram to Stanley on a on a free um just yeah it just shows again that that recruitment that we've got um is he someone that I want to go go into the season relying on for 35 plus games no it's not so I think we, de we definitely do need a body but someone of his ilk that can add some some sort of creativity in that midfield that can really drive us up the pitch I think in, in a midfield too um it, the, the, the way we play you, you've got now a solid back three right and you've got wing backs that can trap back so I think defensively in terms of that you'd, as much as the midfield is there to keep it keep it obviously sure up as well but I think you you, you need you need that midfield to really drive us up the pitch especially if if we win the ball back in our own box and, you, and then you want to try and break fast on them in, in transition getting someone that can drive us up the pitch is really really important and I think Baptiste nails that he's really good and I think we'll still has another gear or two to go in in the coming weeks and months um Clark does that really well but I think so, there's someone that someone out there in the market that we can really bring in and can, can really change us you sort of think about Jusby Hall and the impact that he had with us uh about what four was it four years ago now which is crazy to think um so he he, he just changed it for us he really got us up the pitch he had the quality on the ball to really to really sort of spread the ball about him and find imagine him and imagine him in this side now and again it's a bit different because he's now playing for for Chelsea in the Premier League but even if we had that same 20 or, or whatever he, or whatever he was year old K, KDH in that in this team now I think he would just be an absolute game changer um so someone of that ilk would be excellent for me and obviously there'll be there'll be rumors circulation and there'll be well, I think everyone listening will have their own thoughts on a player they would like to, to bring in, whether that's realistic or particularly ambitious. Uh, we'd love to hear what you have to think have to say about those potential signings or your desired signings in the comments. So be sure to let us know. Um, we will briefly touch on, as Jamie mentioned there, Alfie being linked once again with sort of a move away. Obviously, the club have supposedly said about 15 million for... Alfie, um, Adam, what do you think about that price tag? And should we do everything we can to keep hold of him? Yeah, in a word. Uh, you know, even if he's out of contract next summer, you know, what, what is your goal? I mean, someone tweeted saying, you know, we're, we're a football club, we're not a bank. We need players, not money. And probably for the first time in, in a long time, we don't need money. So even if he's out of contract next summer, I would take that risk. And let him run it down. If we don't get promoted, he he will leave for money or um, uh, sorry, on a free anyway. Uh, you know what what is the value of promotion? It's it's more than fifteen mil, and I just think if you let him go for fifteen million, you've got to spend at least two thirds of that trying to replace him for a top quality championship um, left wing back, unless there's anyone on the market. Um, so yeah, I, I'd keep him at all costs, and I'd take that risk and let him go next summer for nothing if, if we if we really have to. Do you share those thoughts, Jamie? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree, agree. as a player. Um, it's very unlikely that we're going to get anyone um, as as good as him unless there's someone in, in the loan market of a sort of a Premier League club or, or overseas that we think can come in and, and impact straight away. I mean, um, I mean, there's been, there's been a few names mentioned that that could be sort of above a level I think Barker at Brighton could be available but I think he might go to like a lower Prem or maybe overseas team I think Brighton have or, or, or due to sign Kayoglu and then they've got they've got uh, Estu Pinyan as well so it seems like they're pretty set at, at fullback so someone like a Barker if, if we can get him on a loan for a year then um, 
I wouldn't be against selling Doughty for that sort of money. I think it, as long as we've got that replacement, and I, and I don't think the board would sanction any sale if no, without knowing they've got someone lined up. I think you can do these deals nowadays that are, yeah, we, we accept your fee subject to us for finding a replacement. Um, so on on that basis, I mean, fifty million pound. I mean, yeah, we're not we're not short of cash right now, or, or at least we don't think we're short of cash. Obviously, it's just sometimes the, what what we've done in, what we've done in the market might imply that there's there's a few wider um, cash drains, aka power court, right now. But I think fifty million pound still isn't um, isn't a, isn't a number to sniff at. I mean, it's someone that we signed for a fairly nominal fee. We don't know how much it was, but I think it was in the high six low seven figure sort of range um yeah it's it's a, it's a lot of money to to not to not sort of use like if the board would be given 15 million pound now i would hope it they're given it in the expectation that they invest if not all the majority of that of that money and given a recruitment team that is built by many external to Luton as what well, is one of the best best in the country, giving them fifteen million pounds. Um it for me that that could be what what sort of motion. I think if 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 we really are a bit tight for cash at the minute and we get fifteen million quids, we get a couple of loans in, um, we get a couple of five, six million pound players in, suddenly you've lost Doughty but replaced him with four or five quality additions and that could be what gets us promoted anyway. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of subject twos in the answer, but I just think that as long as we have, we have our ducks in a row and there's been lots of, lots of talk about, we, we have, we always have these short lists of sort of two to three players we've got on the back burner. I mean, we should have two, two or three replacements for Eli, for Mengi, for Carlton Morris, for, even though there's currently no links for them to moving away. You never know. You, you never know who might come in for those sort of players. So we should already have two or three players on the back burner that we're looking at signing if if we need to. So hopefully we have that for Alfie. Um, so if we do, I think 50 million quid probably, yeah, I think we, we should consider it very seriously. I, I certainly wouldn't have been adverse to it if it was like early July. Um, you know, but the fact that we were willing to let Giles go on loan in January with this obligation that he would also go on a permanent in the summer and the fact that we weren't needing to be in for someone like Harrison Burrows, who by all accounts went for about two or three mil. Um, I, I, you know, I think there was a time to sell Doughty or consider sales for Doughty. For me, that that's long gone now. I think with, with two weeks to go in the window um, or less than that, we just, it should be hands off to hands off to everybody for the likes of Doughty, Mengi, Adebayo, because, I just don't see how you're going to replace them in what is a potentially big season for us in terms of keeping them, um, you know, lo longer term as well, really. And I think that is something that I think the main issue we've had with the window has been how long we've gone without doing anything. I'm, I'm not sure if you share those opinions. You're both nodding. So it would be, in your mind, it would be too too late to to let someone go now. I th I think so. I I and, and particularly those players, right? So not anybody, because obviously, like we're going to let Townsend go clearly. But when you look at that, you know, you say to other fans who are Luton's best players, and it's Doughty, Mengi, Adebayo, Morris. If you, I think we're absolutely barking mad to let any of them go now. You know, even if someone comes in with fifteen, twenty million for Adebayo, how much is it going to cost you to replace him? And who who do you replace him with? I. I like I say, I think, you know, I wasn't adverse to, to any of them going for, for decent money, but not on the 19th of August or beyond. Um, so for me, they all stay. And if they do stay, you know, we should be mounting a pretty serious um, promotion bid. I, I think I think for me, there's always opportunities to develop, though. And for as good as Alfie Doughty has been in certainly in that first six months of the Premier League, he was probably as bad in that second six months. Um, and he started well this season. I think he's, he's, there's no complaints for me. He's been a solid seven out of ten so far. Um, but I just think there's always opportunities to develop, and I think I I do agree on Eli and Mengi. I think players like that, there is a price tag that probably won't be reached. I think probably more than twenty five, thirty million pound range. But I think there's always that element of contract situation that you have to take into account, and 
to lose someone on a free that you could have got fifteen million pound for what's only a season. I don't know. It just it just feels like we could see it as an opportunity to develop. Maybe Rob might want to look at doing going in a different direction because he wasn't a Rob Edwards signing. He's very much feels like a Rob Edwards player, but maybe there's something about Alfie that Rob might think. Actually, I think we're missing X, Y, and Z that we could recruit elsewhere. Um, so no, I, I think there, it's never too late to sell anyone if if the price is right. I think even on deadline day, right? I think it, even if on deadline day we got a bid of 20, 25 million because you had, say, say Crystal Palace lose Mitchell for four months in the next, in the next couple of weeks because Mitchell has, has a really bad injury. And then suddenly Palace are desperate for, le- for a left wing back to come in and play certainly for four months and hopefully thereafter. You could see them parting ways with 20, 25 mil for Doughty especially if they get 65 mil for Gay as well, right? So if that sort of money comes in for Abu Dhabi on deadline day, okay, I think we obviously we need to have a backup ready to go. That could be a loan signing. It could be that Palace have a academy left wing back. That, okay, look, yeah, you will accept your bid, but we'll, we'll have your academy left wing back on loan for for, 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 for six, 12 months. Um, there's always situations that I think could play out. Um, so I, I, I don't think you can ever say, it's oh, it's too late to sell a player. I think we'll we'll come back to this conversation maybe a bit later in the window when we when we know if any more business has happened. Obviously, there are, as we mentioned, rumours circulating and quite solid rumours by the sounds of it around another centre back in McGuinness. But for now, we'll call it a day there. Obviously, we'll be back later this week to look ahead to the trip to Preston. But for now, once again, be sure to follow us on all our socials at Oak Road Hatter. Like, share, and subscribe on YouTube and rate us five stars on your audio platforms. Thank you for listening and thank you for joining me, Adam and Jamie.